Hello, everybody. Sarah and I are back for another Redstone Glen book club, and uh, we are so glad that you're tuning in tonight to uh, follow our new book, Follow the Flock by Sally Coldhard. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is our fourth book. Can you believe it? I, it's You know, Sarah, it's just so hard to believe. And I thought, when, when you chose this, now here's another book about sheep. What can we learn? Right. Uh, folks, if you haven't started reading it yet, you need to get started right away because I learned so much in the first two chapters. And we're going to talk about them here agree. Tonight. I felt like you can never learn enough facts about the things that you love. And That's right. for sure, this is one of those books that every page I tend to be learning something a little bit different about sheep than the mainstream spinning and weaving. Right. Um, sort of facts that we know are having well, our, in our back pocket. For you and I, who are both spinners, um, you know, just to learn about this whole evolution of sheep and where they came from. And you look at some of those early breeds, which uh, Sarah has so nicely uh, brought up pictures and things for you to see a little bit later, but to see what those early sheep look like. Right. And now we go to places like, uh, and pretty soon I'm thinking uh, in a few weeks we have uh, the New York State uh, Rhinebeck. Rhinebeck yeah. is coming up. And then next year, Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. Hopefully they'll all be open. But you look at those sheep in those pens, and then you look at the pictures of these early sheep, and you go, wow. They've come a long They've come way. A long way. <laughs> They've come a long way. And we're going to talk a lot about that in these first two chapters, is how we came from 10 to 20 million years ago, the first sheep, you know, make their yeah. way on planet Earth, to what we have for our modern day um uses and it's a wide range of uses we're going to be talking about well were you surprised like sally opened this up just giving some history about these asiatic sheep yeah and how they migrated down into the fertile crescent they went west they went exactly south, but they went over the bering strait much like uh the early native ancestors that we uh have here in the united Correct. states yeah and did they bring the sheep with them who knows yeah. but or did they just tiptoe across the ice and come in here. But yeah. One of the, the continuing research that I found for you folks is for those of you who are really into sheep um, and you really want to know a lot more about the original Asiatic sheep and their movements, this is a wonderful website. It does get a little techy, but it is certainly thorough. Um, but it takes you through this whole migration, um, gives you a nice time period, um, as well as sort of where they ended up um, in modern day times, which is wonderful. And Deb, F, this is new for everybody because, again, this is our first one of the new book club season. Mm -hmm. As I share websites here during our broadcast, our dear friend Deb is going to be putting those links right down in the comments section. So if there's something that intrigues you and you want to do continuing research, you can just follow the links from there to make it easier. And they can do that through every yeah, week every week you and can you tune just in. gather them up because a lot of these are a lot of continued reading or videos that i'd like for you guys to watch for more information yeah, yeah. so yeah so these asiatic um mouflon sheep mm -hmm. made their way out and sort of migrated out and sort of spidered out in all corners of the world and as recent as seven hundred and fifty thousand years ago they made it to north america which was pretty awesome as recent as recent. 750,000 Well, years. compared to 10 yeah. to 20 million years, well, that's it's true. far more recent. That's true. Yeah. Now, some of the earliest domestications that we see is at a site in Turkey. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know what? I'm not going to be able to pronounce the name. <laughs> no, that's okay. But, yes, this Mary Steiner of the University of Arizona in Tucson uh, stumbled across this site. And it was interesting because these early inhabitants in Turkey... Um, she found out, and, and you know, you have to sort of think like, as you dig through the layers and the layers and the layers, what she's finding is that some of the earliest findings that they were eating fish, they were eating uh, rabbit, they were eating wild game, and then all of a sudden there is uh, sheep carcasses right. and bones. Yeah, and, so, and plentifully, which means that at some point they decided it was much easier, instead of going on hunting, to just keep some back at camp to make it easier when it was time to, to right. feed everyone. And and how they did that, reading <laughs> through here a little bit further, oh my gosh, like how do you domesticate a wild animal? Yeah. So what we found is, and I find this intriguing, is that here you have wild animals, and um, as they pointed out, um, 
you know, you have a wild animal and you try to take its young and nurture it through nature. And then all of a sudden um, you're going to have this, this animal sort of link onto you and say, oh, you're my mother. And so as she pointed out, like some of the wild animals, um, let's say in New Guinea, where a woman was um, oh, breastfeeding a piglet. I don't know. When I was a young, impressionable young man, I remember looking at National Geographic. And there was a woman, she was nursing her child, but she was also nursing a very small piglet to keep it alive so the people in the tribe would have something to eat later on. Uh, Sally seems to think through her research that maybe this was something that uh, these early inhabitants were also doing is that they were um, getting these animals to connect with them uh, so that they sort of bonded. And so in doing that, they were able to start hurting these animals and uh, keeping them in fences. And, uh, and there you, all of a sudden you get domestic sheep. Now this did not happen overnight. It took many hundreds of years to be able to eventually come around that um, they were comfortable and staying there, but you um, know, in, in a fenced area. But also, how dogs also played into that as well. So um, the whole story is really quite fascinating, and I think uh, as you get through chapter one, you're really going to like that. Um, let's see. Let's go on in here a little bit further. Um, yeah, they talk about the, the sheep dogs and how they, the herding instincts with that. Um, also. Ah, Sarah has this whole thing written out for us, and, ah, this was really quite interesting. Points of domestication, uh, discovered by a gentleman, Jared Diamond, and there were six things that he discovered which made it a lot easier to domesticate an animal. First of all, when you think about all animals, um, what do they need to be? And one of them is they cannot be a picky eater. Somebody that will eat not only grass, but hay, uh, wild uh, uh, weeds and things like that, such as sheep, are going to be easier to domesticate. The other thing that's important is that they mature rather quickly. So if you've got an animal that is going to take five or six years to get to the point where you could eat it, uh, that's not something that you want. You're going to want an animal that is going to mature quickly, and that's exactly what sheep did. Um, cope with breeding in captivity. Now, we've all heard about the problems with the panda bears at the zoos, and when they do have an offspring, uh, it makes major news all around the world. So um, when we look at um, you know, th animals that don't mind breeding in captivity, that's a very positive thing. Also, a docile nature. If you've got skittish animals, animals that are going to run off, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for something that's going to be happy to be around. Um, they can't be too panicky. Now, I've talked to many a shepherd who has said, I've got the craziest daggone sheep, and some breeds seem to be a little bit more skittish. Um, I've not owned Cheviot sheep myself. We had some border lesters when you were little, and they were just sweet they animals. They were. They were sweet. But the Cheviot seemed to be like crazy animals. And Scottish blackface seemed to be another one of those breeds. Well, and some of the, the remains that they were found in, finding at these sites yeah. were things like deer. A deer makes a very poor choice for domestication. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yet I mean, they're now starting to farm them. Yes, they are now farming <laughs> them now. Yeah. But they, they figured it all out. Yeah. It's only taken 10,000 yeah. years to be able to do it. Yeah. And lastly, I mean, they have to be able to follow social structure so that if they're being followed by a shepherd, they, they need to sort of fall in line based mm -hmm. on a hierarchy. Well, you, you've had animals uh, <laughs> when you were not only children, but you and Dustin had animals. And all you have to do is go out there with the feed bucket. Just shake and it And they just follow you right yeah. behind. That's what yeah. we're looking for. Now, I do want to sort of talk about the expanse of the breeds. And one of the sites, sorry, I navigated away from, is some of the breeds that are recognized here today. And this mm -hmm. is a great site. That list, I think I counted up to 223 different breeds. But what I really liked about this site was no matter who you, you clicked on, it gives you a little bit more information as well as sort of an idea of their size and their weight and their fiber. Yeah. 223 different breeds. I mean, like who knew? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure over the years there's been many, many more, but we mm -hmm. just sort of had to like 
you know, some have fallen out of popularity and some have maintained. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things that I thought was important to sort of talk about was that domestication process. And I had heard about this study years ago, but the silver foxes, mm -hmm. I yeah. thought that was really interesting. And I was actually able um, to find a video that I think you guys should take the time to go and source take a look out. At this. Okay. Yep. Uh, the silver fox, it, they started domesticating them and um, and it was a lot harder. I mean, it's a lot harder to do. Like a single gene. In some situations, still a few genes. Anna Kukekova is a professor of animal sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Since 2002, she's been collaborating with the Institute in Russia on genetics research. Her goal is to reach the absolute core of the fox experiment, the specific genes involved in fox domestication. And a few weeks ago, she and her team published a paper in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution that made a lot of progress. Now we know that there are about 100 regions uh, in fox genome which in some way can contribute to some behaviors, same behavior, friendly behavior, or aggressive behavior. On his two minutes, the foxes would... So one of the things that I found really interesting about this particular video was the fact that even after 50 years of breeding these towards domestication, what they found is that many traits, as far as like friendliness, they were able to sort of uh, characterize but basic traits like hunting they immediately turned around and went after the chickens so yeah yeah that you just cannot get that out of their natural uh instinct exactly yeah now let's talk about this next video because some of these ancient breeds that we still have some characteristics are the shetland sheep do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about this process Dad? sure um Actually, ruing is something that I was really quite unfamiliar with. Uh, I mean, I had always uh, seen people who will be shearing sheep. We take the wool, we process it, and we go from there. But this idea of ruing, um, some of the early people, and yet there's still breeds today that you can do this, where you actually um, hold the animal down and, and pluck the wool from it. So they will naturally molt themselves, but we have, over the years... Uh, bred that out of it. And this wool, uh, from what I understand, is really quite coarse. So these are the type of wools that you're going to be using for carpets, um, for heavy-duty uh, type fabrics. It's not the type of thing that you want to have a sweater close to your skin surface. But uh, yeah, can you imagine just being able to pluck that out? And yet some of these ancient breeds... Um, yeah, Sarah, you had the one with the huge horns, and you could actually see the wool just molting yes. right off the animal's yeah. body. So that's going to be the European mouflon. So there you these go. are still widely found, but these look very, very similar to the Asiatic that we were mm -hmm. discussing earlier. And, you know, here we have some uh, the Hebridean sheep. Uh, again, look at the large horns on those sheep, the Icelandic sheep, long stapled wools. And sometimes you're going to find some of these animals are actually double coated. And so you're going to have this long sort of coarse wool that you see from the outside. But as you get closer to the skin surface, um, it's very soft, very downy. So spinners need to take that fleece and actually uh, pull it apart yeah. and, um, and, and separate that out. Yeah. And the soy. And the soy. Yeah. And you know what? This one probably gets the most amount of credit because the Orkney sheep are so interesting in that they live in very extreme environments. Um, they don't need to be sheared. You can see the fiber just falls off of them. Right. And, and they live on a diet uh, of lots of um, seaweed. Oh, seaweed. Yeah. 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 Now, I still want to go back because the ruling I found very interesting. I've never actually had a chance to experience this myself. But take a moment just to watch this process. It's really interesting. So this is Freya. Is that right? No, it no. isn't. I Free. forget her name. Oh, it's 1352. <laughs> her fleece is naturally breaking off before shearing time. It's called ruing. And so Jen is taking advantage <laughs> of this beautiful black fleece. By I'm so excited. By peeling a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Peeling the sheep. Ruining. Yeah, so there's a natural break in the fiber. Here, I'll, I'll do a real slow one so you can sort of see close up. And you can just watch the fibers separating. It doesn't hurt the sheep at all. 
Look at that. And Isn't that interesting? And if it wild, this would just sh shed off because it's healthy for the sheep to lose their fleece once a year. And it's just feels awesome. It feels nice and greasy. <laughs> so I had to share that with you all because, again, like I have never... I've never no. seen that process done. And for those of you who have Shetland sheep at home, which I'm seeing in Donna down here says that she has some Shetland sheep, mm -hmm. that she's maybe going to try that herself. It'd be interesting to find out what other breeds share that same characteristic. Well, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I've mm -hmm. talked to people, I've never owned Angora rabbits myself, but they talk about it at a certain point, they would blow their coat. Um, I've known people, and I bet you have too also, mm -hmm. Uh, dogs, uh, yeah. like a collie, yeah. springtime, all of a sudden your house is just covered Exploding. with dog, with dog yeah. hair. So, you know, this is a, a natural process, totally. but we have domesticated many of the breeds mm -hmm. that they rely on human interaction to share them. That's Where exactly this ancient right. breed, they yeah. just, yeah. And in some cases, we it's almost torturous for the animal because if a human doesn't get in there and share the animal... It can be life threatening for them. Sure. Do you remember it, the Australian oh merino gosh. that went like four years? It ran off and came yeah, back, and yeah. they sheared almost a hundred pounds of wool. That's off exactly that right. That's so, exactly right. That's cool. Now we have seen lots of cultures, and throughout the book, she's mentioned several. Um, but one of the others that we have to sort of take light to, um, and please excuse me, I I do not have a strong point in uh, Middle Eastern or Central Asian language, but the common name is the burnt city of Iran. And this is such an interesting archaeological site for folks to examine because of the fact that they have a thousand years of history to observe what was happening in their culture. That's amazing. And so the first 500 years, they're mm -hmm. seeing one thing, and the second, they're seeing the latter, uh, just domestication and a total diet versus a range of animals being right. consumed. Exactly right. As well as many different species of sheep. I think they found eight different breeds Within, within archaeological it. evidence. So we'll make sure that Deb puts that in the chat section for you. All right. Now, here, Dad, let's talk about this one, because I know you've seen every Nova special. Oh, I remember this. It was all about the <laughs> ice age. She was maiden. frozen in time. And with this one... Was she a priestess? We found a princess. A warrior chief. Teenager. Nova unearths the secrets of the Siberian Ice Maiden. And we were able to see, they said, you know, imagine opening up this tomb and the stench that's coming out of there, it smelt like wet wool. And yet this wool is, you know, a hundreds, what, 2,500 years uh, old, yeah, maybe. Yeah, 2,400 maybe. You know, and everything's preserved perfectly, including our ice maiden, but yeah. there were uh, horses buried with her so she would have transportation in the afterlife. The sheep were important. They were in there as well. But yeah, the, the clothing and everything else, they described her outfit, her um, her clothing with a cinched waistband, yeah. all made out of hand-spun, hand-woven wool. Isn't that interesting? It is. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Now, there was a group of individuals called the Scythians, and these are mentioned several times, but the culture in itself is very interesting in that they had sort of um, nomadic sort of lifestyle, but they have a very, very strong comprehension of felt use for lots of different applications. And look at this soldier's hat. I know, isn't I mean, that interesting? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the shape of it is really, really neat. And you wonder if that was something that was emulating like a swan head. Um, but definitely uses of color would have been emblematic of tribal mm -hmm. tribal use. Um, but please f f navigate over to this website because there's a lot of really interesting information about just their culture in general. Um, they were very accomplished, very, very accomplished. And one of the things that has survived um, from this civilization is one of the oldest carpets ever to be um, unearthed. And it was all by magic. Oh my God. I don't know if you remember this, but Tomb Raiders had left it behind. Water oh, that's right. Dripped in, froze, and preserved it, leaving everything completely intact. I, I want to take a closer look at this rug later on because you can see what looks like military soldiers sure. on horseback. Yeah. And it really sort of. 
tells you a lot about the time Yeah, period. I think there is a nicer detail here. Oh, there, yeah. Yeah, and these actually look like maybe caribou or some sort of other herd-type deer. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. The oldest carpet in the world. <laughs> but they were talking about, you know, learning about felt. Mm -hmm. And they gave several scenarios in the book about, you know, how felt came about. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with that, although... If you're watching this, you're a, you're a fiber person. You're probably familiar with <laughs> felt. We brought some examples out that were recently done in a, a class here where the wool was basically manipulated with either heat or water mm -hmm. and lots of pressure to get these fibers to adhere to one another. Right. And you've got a chart, Sarah. I do. This is a really wonderful um, example of what the scale structure actually looks like on a uh, sheep's wool. And they talk about the scaly quality of it looking mm -hmm. like roofing shingles. Yeah. I remember in class, I was telling people about pine cones. Um, many years ago, I was walking a, a September morning and under this pine tree, um, there were these pine cones. And in the morning with the water and the dew on it, these pine cones were incredibly tightly um, gathered together, the, mm -hmm. the scales on it. And yet, by lunchtime, when the sun hit them, the scales all came out. And when I saw that, it immediately clicked that this is what happens in a felting process. Absolutely. When we add warm water to a, uh, a scaly fiber like wool, those scales open up, and then you agitate them, and those scales interlock with one another, and then you throw cold water, and it contracts around one another again. It locks it together and makes it impossible to pull apart. Yeah. And you probably have all experienced maybe trying to undo a sweater that you've washed and try to pull. It, it's not coming apart. Right. So those scales really prove a great point there. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, I'm going to go back to that because there's some characteristics that really made sheep's fleece simple yet complex. And she talks about this in the book. The first thing being that somehow... It can keep you warm, yet refreshingly cool at the same time, yeah. right? Another thing is that it's going to repel moisture, but also absorb water vapor. And that's mm -hmm. kind of hard to understand, but when you look at the scaly nature of it, you can imagine lots of water running down the fibers, mm -hmm. whereas the little shingle effect, the moisture would actually wick up into them and would hold it. And lastly, one of the best things about it is it can be very, very soft, depending on the breed, but yet it can be strong enough to be fire resistance based on how it, how it's actually constructed. That's true. Yeah. You know, it's often said that, you know, if you were ever caught in a situation where you had to run through a burning building, mm -hmm. grab a wool afghan or a wool blanket and wrap it around you because it will save your life. Yes. You know, many of you probably remember a time when children's uh, sleepwear was um, outlawed if it had synthetic fibers in it. Yes. And so because they melt wool will save your life because it, it immediately goes out yeah. as soon as fire hits it. Now, she talked in the book about a term that I hadn't heard, but which is, um, in its characteristics, heat of absorption. Now, this is something that, again, I had never seen before. Um, but heat absorption, what it really talks about in the breakdown is how the wool fiber itself is able to transfer heat absorption and they actually mm -hmm. describe baling sheep's wool and it actually feeling hot to the touch just sitting there by itself it generates its own heat. heat but for those of you who really geek out on science please navigate over to this website because there is a lot of stuff in here about how that science actually works and the comparisons to wool and nylon yeah yeah, yeah. so make sure that you check this out in the chat section because i think it really explains a lot of what mm -hmm. we know but don't really understand how it works well, the absorption. I mean, I have washed lots of fleeces in my time getting them ready for spinning. Yes. And you put several pounds of wool inside a, a stock pot with yeah. hot water. Yeah. And you think, Where, where'd the water go? Where I mean, it, it, just, go? it just sucked, sucks it all it up. up. And they talk about, you know, things about like 40% it can take up. That's, that's a lot. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. there's a, one more thing that I want to talk about since we're going into felt making, which is Mongolian yurts. Mm hmm this is a video that I'm going to post up for you guys because it's it's like six minutes long, but we're not going to watch the whole thing. But I really wanted you to see a little tidbit of it. So this is the basic shearing process. So they're actually hand shearing. From there, they're going to take the wool. <laughs> see ya. 
And they're going to work together to sort of beat out. Yep. So they're, they're beating the wool. And when I looked at this, I wondered if it wasn't closer to um, maybe like picking the wool, teasing the wool um, before you get ready to, to spin it. Yep. But they're sort of bailing this up. And then they talked about a mother felt. And this looks like a blanket yeah. that they're laying on the ground. And then they're laying the wool on top of this mother felt. There we go. There we go. In layers, just like you would imagine. They're probably cross-hatching it. Sure. Dampening the surface, you know, to create some some of that moisture to help the felting process. Because remember, the ingredients are heat, moisture. Right. And friction. Once it's all laid out, out, they roll it up nice and tight. And then they use the resources they have around them. And it could be a horse or a camel. It looks like the biggest burrito you've ever seen in your life. And so now they're going to roll that up with the camel. Sorry, I'm going to show some in progress. Because the camel does all the work. It just walks around for a few hours rolling that felt. What we would do with like a... A, a lawn roller. A lawn roller. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Until it actually is unfurled, you've got these big, beautiful pieces of felt. And look at this. And it's stable, folks. This is going to become, in a very short period of time, the outside covering of a Mongolian yurt. So exactly now right. they're re-rolling it again, and they'll just continue to drag that behind the camel or horses until it is of a consistency that they want. Mm -hmm. And then it's stretched around uh, a framework, which looks a lot like, um, like a baby gate. Yeah, exactly. I think this is interesting. They're wrapping the, the rope around it just to kind of keep it bound and tight. Looks kind of fun. I'd like that job. There you go. Yeah. But the Mongolian yurts, I mean, this is a modern day example of what they might look like right now. But the the more modern convenience of having water repellent canvases mm -hmm. are probably nice. But underneath it, the wool serves two purposes. It's insulation, but it's also waterproofing as well. And what a perfect thing for a, uh, an area where the climate is really harsh. I mean, it's not unusual to have 10, 15, 20 degrees below zero. Yeah. And they're toasty as can be. I thought it was interesting that there was comments made about who takes credit for being the first felt makers right. and all the stories that are associated with. But do you remember there used to be a dance company that would come to Manning's when we were there mm -hmm. and they would buy raw wool and they were putting it into the toes of their the slippers and ballet, ballet yeah. slippers. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have moisture, you have sweat from that and you got the pressure of a yeah. human body. You know, It'll pressing continue on that. to felt it into it, nice soft pads right. that are yeah. molded to their feet or at least create some some padding for sure. them. Yeah. And of course, Makes sense. yeah. Now, as we sort of go through these chapters, I think that we're going to find many more instances where sheep have sort of shaped our history. But these early people, you think about making that first shift from we're going to be hunter-gatherers to we're mm -hmm. going to make our lives a little bit easier and we're going to bring them home and start selecting those that are better for our use than others. We completely changed our civilization. What a great kickoff to this book. And, and you know, think about taking these uh, wild sheep yeah. and then, like we were talking about, just interbreeding them, interbreeding them, keeping the best traits, getting yes. rid of the horns, because nobody wants to share a sheep with horns on yeah. it. Uh, that's sort of dangerous. But then also this wool goes from very, very dark color, gray colors, to bright white, and now we can dye it. Now we can dye. Can you imagine yeah. how amazing that would have been to finally get away from brown all the time? Yeah. 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 It's amazing it's to me also, you know, looking at some of the other books that we've examined and knowing the history of things like flax and silk, which have been around for, you know, 6,000 years, sheep are really late to the game mm -hmm. as far as the domestication aspect. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm certainly grateful to all these people who thought, hey, this would be a good idea. I agree. And they go from uh, hunter-gatherers to, to farmers and um, and find out that sheep are delicious also. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'm hoping that you all enjoyed your evening this evening. We've had a lot of great information, and I give you a lot of videos to go back and watch. Um, please go watch the yeah, one on the yurt making. Yeah, please go watch it. It's really fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, next week. Yeah. October 13th. We're going to be going over chapters three and four. So, um, Tom, what are you thinking? You've read ahead a little bit. To 
be honest with you, I haven't gotten any further. You haven't. I have You're not. You're so good. I usually am so good about okay. this, but yeah, I had a busy weekend. So I, I'm looking forward to awesome. finding out about three and four. Yeah. How many of you have already read about it? <laughs> well, anyway, this evening has been wonderful. We're so glad to be back doing this every week with yeah. you. Um, please continue to share this with your friends. This is going to be up in our Facebook page as well as our YouTube page so they can go back and watch it um, and comment on it later. And you can yeah check out through the rest of the week and mm -hmm. uh, tell all your friends about it. We'll see you next week at the same time. Bye now, guys. Good night.